This is Hear Me Out, the podcast whose name will probably change very soon because it's, uh, unbeknownst to us, one of the most common podcast names you could possibly have. There's Hear Me Out, uh, Go Hear Me Out, Now Hear Me Out, Okay Hear Me Out. And uh, we were, we didn't realize that. Even Larry King apparently has a podcast called Hear Me Out. So we were a little late on the uh, naming the title there. I'm joined by Max from SBN3 right now. He has... Uh, New uh, short film or feature film. I'm not sure what uh, category it falls under. How's it going? It's over 40 minutes. It's a feature. Uh, okay, great. It's, it's going good. What's going on? What's uh, what's the problem with your name here? Yeah, well, it's one of those things like um, how everyone names their kid uh, Michael or, or, or Peter. And uh, we need to figure out some sort of new name or something like that because it's... Uh, uh, we don't want to change it entirely. I mean, what are you talking about? I don't about? know. Uh, well, we talk about, um, we talk about hearing us out, but I guess that's the kind of the concept of every single podcast out there. Um, uh, we want, this is the podcast as the, our listeners know, or probably don't know that we take, uh, your controversial topics and play devil's advocate on them. Not too controversial. Um, we need to tack something on at the beginning or the end to like sort of diversify it from all the other podcasts with a similar concept. Uh, you could, uh, all right, you could you could flip it on its head. You could say like, "Don't listen to me at all." You could call it that. You could call it <laughs> like you call it mute this podcast. You could call it that. Okay, yeah, well, so sort of, of a uh, reverse psychology kind of thing. Yeah, you got to go full antihero. Yeah, exactly. How about we call it? Don't hear me out. Don't hear me out. This is the worst podcast you'll ever hear. Uh, you know, that's probably not good for advertising getting you, sponsors. You can call, call it like objectively bad podcast. Sorry, I just try to scrush <laughs> a fly on my screen. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, no, objectively by a podcast, that's a pretty good idea. Yeah, and it'll be the uh, one of the more honest podcasts if we title it like that then. Yeah, I'd agree. Yeah, 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 that's a good point. All right, yeah, we'll think about it. We'll get it down on paper and uh, uh, brainstorm, get a, uh, what's that called? Like, focus group. Yeah, we'll focus group it. Something like that. Brainstorm, yeah, workshop yeah. it. That's the phrase. There, that's, that's what we want to do. Um, yeah, you got some workshops, actually, that uh, you teach out in um, New York, right? No, I just teach them online. Oh, you teach them online. Okay, that's great. And yeah. it's um, you're doing a writing and uh, directing sort of uh, workshops, I, right? I, I teach, oh God, I teach joke writing, teach screenwriting, teach sound design, mm -hmm. teach uh, song mixing, teach, or not song mixing, just like general audio mixing. I teach... Um, what else? I guess recording engineering. I teach voice directing. I teach uh, cinematography. I teach. I can teach sometimes color grading. It depends on what people want. When somebody signs up for a category, I, I tell them, you know, prepare your own questions or prepare specifically what you want to learn from this, like what technique you need to learn from this. And we'll go to that because the, the thing with teaching, really teaching anything is that unless they they're enthusiastic about learning, like or trying to get to a certain point. There's really no point in what you're saying. You know, mm. they have to have the questions. They have to be formulating the questions and they have to be asking, how do I get to this point? So, um, you know, I have a very flexible curriculum with, I guess, the, the you know, when, when somebody signs up for a workshop and it, it's 80 bucks and then like they get a couple free follow ups and, you know, they want film critiques and cinematography critiques uh, or, you mm. know, critiques of their work to try to get to a better place. Uh, but that's sort of what I do for that. And uh, not to get too out there, but... I'd say about 35% of the time, they thank me like I did it for free when it's done. Oh, <laughs> well, no, that's great. Yeah, I, uh, you definitely have a lot of experience in those categories. You've been um, producing content on YouTube and SoundCloud and uh, I assume a lot of other platforms uh, for quite a while now. When did you start doing all these um, projects uh, regarding video? Uh, I started taking it seriously maybe like, uh, like March 2019, somewhere around there. Or sorry, 2013. Yeah, no, mm -hmm. I'm not brand new. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, 2013. Yeah. I started taking it serious about 2013 when I was like, I don't know, I, I was like 18 years old still, I think. And um, mm -hmm. so, yeah, I was just I was just putting stuff out like constantly working like probably like 105 hours a week just trying to get videos out. Because, I, you know, when you're 18, you don't really have any real commitments. You don't you know, you don't have to go out to a job every day. You don't really have to do anything when you're 18 for some mm -hmm. people. So I was just, you know, I was just doing that. It, it really was like just a full on hustle. So then, you know, it, I was uploading like two shorts a week for like eight months, something like that, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, like there's no days off for that. There's no rest. There's no nothing. And then uh, I, I slowed it down to once a week. And, and I realized that uh, and, and every now and then I consider, oh, well, what if I went back to the twice a week thing? 
But then I realized it's there were techniques and things I was just lazily overlooking when I was producing back then that it would just be impossible to ever do that again because of sort of the meticulous approach that I take now that I didn't really take back then. Yeah. So do you feel like if you did go back to that sort of approach now, you'd be more qualified to do that? Or are you satisfied with uh, the approach that you have now? I mean, I, look, I don't I'll be satisfied when I don't have to put anything on YouTube, honestly. Um, <laughs> like that's a good point. You know, like I, I want to work for a TV show. I want to work, you know, <clears throat> on commercials like that's what I'm trying to do. And I get jobs for that mm. every now and then. Like I want to work for video games. I want to work, you know, and I've had jobs doing all those things in, in varying capacities in one way or another. But, uh, you know, you just sort of, you do your own little self-promotion, you work on your passion projects, you do all that stuff to promote yourself as a talent uh, to mm -hmm. hopefully get hired for, for that big deal, whatever it may be. Yeah, and did you get all your experience like working on the job, quote unquote, or or did, did you take some sort of uh, schooling in any capacity? Didn't really take, I mean, I, I took like a film study course in high school, which is where they mm -hmm. like have the English teacher do one film class because at the end of the day, screenwriting is, I guess, the most important thing for an uh, intro into understanding film. Mm -hmm. uh, and so how would I put this? But it, it was really just like working on my own projects. Just that. Liter literally yeah. just that is just constantly like I, I didn't get, um you know, hired to shoot for anyone until maybe a few months into it. And it was mm -hmm. uh, I, I was paid a hundred bucks to like video two guys playing their acoustic guitars, singing in um, some language that I don't know. I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. That's offensive. Yeah, but uh, uh, yeah, that's um, I feel like uh, with, with any sort of um, artistic realm that I enter into, uh, most of the time I'm very much just working off of my own experience of uh, very little schooling or, or tutoring from anyone. And uh, typically in artistic industries, it's it's about the experience, and that's what a lot of people don't understand. They could take however many years of film school, but if they've never actually like sat down and edited a film, they're not going to understand editing. They're not going to understand directing until they actually direct someone. Yeah, and I had to create my own experience. Like there there was no film sets I could just you know run and go be a part of. Like I was I mm -hmm. wasn't in areas where that was possible. We could just jump mm -hmm. on a film set and learn the whole process. So you had to do it slowly and slowly. So through working, I developed my own experience. But then once I had all this experience and I had my own like workflow of doing things, that's when I started trying to reach out to people who knew way more than me. Because I knew mm -hmm. that there was a big separation in knowledge between me and, you know, whatever standard industry filmmaker there is. And so I would start going on forums. I would reach out to people. Hey, can I talk on Skype? Can I talk on Facebook Messenger? Can I talk on whatever? And I, I would mm -hmm. reach out and talk to these guys. And, um, you know, guys who were like 40, 50, like they, they would just give me all the info. Uh, like, and, and, you know, they, they a lot of them were kind of like intrigued by a guy so young trying to learn just older technology and, and traditional grip and lighting and, and, mm -hmm. you know, and I, like, like I would talk to audio engineers and stuff like that. I learned, you know, all that stuff. And but yeah, so it, it, it takes a village to build it. It takes a village to build like the whole, I guess, like the whole package of what you see when it comes to the production mentality for for anything. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, going back to what you were saying about um, asking about older and traditional techniques and stuff, I was surprised when you referenced uh, What's Up Tiger Lily, which is obviously a. Woody Allen film, yep. and uh, you were referencing that when you were making, um, uh, you've made quite a few series in the same kind of uh, genre uh, of of dubbing films, um, and the the feature film that you have coming out right now is uh, Taste Close, the uh, is uh, around fifty minute uh, feature film, right? It's a, uh, I think it's an hour long, like just an hour yeah. flat. Uh, mm -hmm. Taste Closed, Heaven Ain't Hard to Find is the the title we're going with for release. Um, I keep calling it the Taste Closed feature. Uh, just, oh. just because like whatever, but yeah, it's taste closed. Heaven ain't hard to find. And, um, <laughs> cause, cause I, and I called it that because like when I was watching the show, uh, or I was watching through the clips and stuff of all the stuff, I noticed like everywhere these people went in this cartoon, everybody just mm -hmm. dies. Yeah. Like, and that's uh, a detective Conan, right? Yeah. And so yeah. like everybody, like every episode, somebody dies. So I'm like. Hey man, heaven ain't hard to find, you know. Like so, it, it, it's <laughs> it, it's it's sort of like that where you know death is around every corner. So that's why I sort of that's why I came up with that. And I'm trying to. And there was uh like the there was a taste closed like mini series, uh and the first two parts were on YouTube and they mm -hmm. blew up on Reddit. They got like like three hundred thousand hits in a day or something like that. Mm -hmm. 
And um, so uh, there was there was demand for this. So I, you know, I got some funding for it and I went from there. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. I absolutely think the writing is um, it's it's on this next level. Like er, earlier, I had compared it to an abridged series. And then when you clarified, I, I totally understand the reasoning that you had behind it, because you're not just making a parody. You're writing an entirely new script to go with pre-existing video and and some people might not understand how how the difficulties that come with doing something like that because in one you're saving yourself a lot of time because you don't have to like film or animate anything but on the other hand now you have uh some sort of limitations with what's presented on screen you're a slave. as opposed to what you want to write yeah you're a slave to the footage you're a slave to their continuity and you have to make mm-hmm. sure whatever story you write matches that footage yeah yeah, and then that's obviously a difficulty. I know with uh, a lot of other uh, series that kind of do the same thing, um, or they'll, they'll do dubs or they'll do a bridge series, they spend a lot of time with the uh, the, the lip flaps to get the uh, mouths to match. Is that something that you're concerned with? Uh, no, that's honestly like the easiest part of it. Um, mm-hmm. I, I don't know how anybody cares with, with that. <laughs> like I see a lot of people freak out. And the other interesting thing is they always do it wrong uh, when I see mm-hmm. other people do it. All pretty much, to my knowledge, of, of every cartoon that's been released, it like you know, two thousand five and back, uh, or mm-hmm. anime cartoon, all the lips, uh, it's it's three frames. It's the closed mouth, the half open mouth, and the full open mouth. Mm-hmm. And that animation, that mouth animation, is always animated on threes. It is yeah. it, it's always moving at eight frames per second. So you just mm-hmm. find that you find an open, a close, and a you know, or an open and a half open. And then you paste it mm-hmm. over a closed screen, you know, freeze frame, and you just keep pasting that to match whatever the dialogue is that that you might have. And uh, so, yeah, so yeah. you can take a two second shot and turn it into a twenty second shot. Mm-hmm. All I know is I, I had to copy and paste enough to where I, I learned about it. Um, yeah, I learned about it just through just through working with the footage. That's it. I didn't read anything. Yeah, well, that's um, really cool. How you're uh, uh, taking all this experience that you've had, which is. A lot of experience. You told me you're working like over a hundred hours, uh, over a hundred hours a week, and that's kind of ridiculous. I um, was not anymore. Was yeah, 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 yeah. You were, but yeah. now, um, yeah, you're uh, putting yourself out there uh, doing workshops and stuff like that, and then you got a Patreon too that uh, you use to fund um, this new feature film, right? No, I didn't use the Patreon to fund this. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, Patreon. The, the people on Patreon, they just back just generally just me, mm. you know, back, back any creative endeavor I might have. And shout out to everybody on Patreon. Uh, you know, the, the money helps. The money uh, solves a lot of problems I might have, whether it be, you know, a production issue or I need a proper piece of gear for a shoot or something like that. You know, that's where that stuff comes in handy. So that's made uh, it, it's not I'm not going to say it's fully made certain shoots possible. But what mm. it has done is it solved a lot of problems during shoots. And that's crucial. Oh, too. I say. Yeah. You told me earlier that you raised a surprising amount of money for this uh how much money did you raise to make this film it was like uh like somewhere like a little over two grand something like that yeah and like like that's for uh creators online that could be quite a bit i know like when you're working on like an actual uh like a like a even an independent film you need quite a bit of money but um that's pretty substantial to raise for uh this film and i i think i think it definitely shows because you've been working on this since um what is it? You said you were working on this started last year working on this? Well, okay, so the funding happened. We got the funding mm-hmm. uh like maybe like spring 2018 and I, I init- the uh what's it called? We initiated the funding uh like a year prior. So it took a year to fund, so I'm like, okay, it took a year to fund. Well, it's going to take me a year to start cuz I was busy mm-hmm. with a bunch of other stuff. I was I was putting out music. I was uh I, I was working on a pitch pilot for a TV show. I was working on, oh my God, I got a contract for sound design. I had a bunch of things to do, a bunch, mm-hmm. bunch of things to do. And so I was like, okay, I'm just going to worry about this next year. So February 1st, 2019 uh, was the day that I started writing the the, t- the Taste Close screenplay. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and that was cool just in the sense that I could finally, I wasn't like, you know, constrained to this limit or like this this expectation of getting it done in a week. I could just sit there and uh, I think it took like two months to write the script. Or maybe it was just a month. I can't remember. But there was a lot of procrastinating mm-hmm. in the middle there. Just uh, just a bunch of things. But anyway, uh, yeah, so it took a bit of time. But I was finally able to like, you know, create like a plot that has, you know, you know, setups and payoffs and like has side stories and has all these different things, um, you know, sort of like a Seinfeld episode. I was watching a lot of Seinfeld yeah. before I started uh-huh. writing. 
Yeah, no, that's funny. That's what is. Uh, that's what I was thinking of when I was watching it. That uh, they always have like these tangents that seem unrelated, and then they all culminate into one thing. You yep. do have a very particular writing style, particularly with your dialogue. It's very quick and it's very snappy. And um, there's a lot of what seems like intricate references. Like you're not trying to appeal to the mainstream. It seems like. Would you say? I mean, I don't know. It it, it depends. I mean, I I'd say. I mean, you mentioned a bridge series earlier. I'd say what I'm doing is mm-hmm. is a lot more mainstream of what they do. Like, I don't have any, mm-hmm. like, anime or, like, niche anime or video game references or internet memes. Like, I don't put any of that in my work. Um, yeah. The, uh, like, we were test screening this uh, for, like, uh, one of the one of the actors, he uh, he played it for his brother and his friends who had never seen any of my videos. And they had, mm-hmm. they, like, they, every joke hit. You know, they loved all of it. And these aren't guys who were on the you know, who are like looking at anime Twitter 24 seven. These are just like regular dudes. Like one guy was a lifeguard. One guy was a stockbroker, you know? So yeah. it's, um, what's it called? It, it, I don't know. It, it gets topsy turvy where, and I get that a lot where, where I get like the, the anime watchers. Cause obviously a lot of those guys are going to come in and yeah. I get a lot of the anime watchers and they're like, Oh, these are a lot of niche references. And I'm like, I, I made a sports reference. Everybody watches <laughs> sports, but you dude, like, you know, uh, yeah. it, and so it becomes this topsy turvy like culture flip where where the the inmates are running the asylum so to speak. Yeah. Uh, but it's I don't know. Um, the yeah. uh, well, I guess, I guess that's where my issue was because I'm definitely more on the the anime side. That's probably when when I started watching your stuff is because I was looking for anime related dubs and and a bridge series and things right. like that. Um, it's um yeah because you have uh you have two other series on your channel um. That uh, one's based off of um, obviously uh, Dragon Ball Z, um, and then the other one is uh, Yu Yu Hakusho, right? Yes, correct. Yeah, yeah, and then uh, yeah. So it seems like you're like at first glance, my my thought was like, oh, he's definitely trying to appeal to like the anime crowd, or maybe he's super into anime. Is it is that the case, or do you use those types of medium because they um, it's it's very easy to dub over those types of things? Uh, well, f- anime because yeah, it's it's easier to dub because of the lip flap thing, because mm-hmm. the, the the animation is slower, therefore more exploitable. Um, yeah. But then also, uh, I, I do it because like, dude, look, it gets clicks. It, it gets clicks yeah. at the end of the day, and it's like nobody wants to watch anything original. They they want to <laughs> watch something that's based on their predetermined interest. They want to see something come up in the related thing, and uh, and so you know, and I mean, like, obviously, I saw those shows when I was a kid, but like, the point isn't. Like it, it, it's weird when people call it a fan dub because like, you know, it's not really I don't really make it for fans of of the people. I just make it for somebody who just wants comedy. That's that's all I make it for, you know, yeah. like like that's that's what I'm trying to do. And I try to assert that, like, you know, all this stuff, you, you take away all the visuals and you just let it be a radio play with with none mm. of that. It, it's you know, it, it's it's still pretty much hits the same, you know. Yeah, no, you're right. Higher. It would. It would it probably still sticks. It's a, it's a, it's a vehicle for you to write something that you're already intending to write to, um, to advertise your comedy or just to have like a purpose to write something. Right. Right. And also for sound design too, a big challenge that, that I put upon myself is I wanted to outdo the original sound design of the Mm. shows. Oh yeah. No, that's, that's exactly what I noticed. There was a, there's a scene in particular where it stood out to me where the, um, the characters they're standing in, what no one would ever think to add any sort of like echo and delay. You're, they're standing in like a long hallway with uh, uh, wood floors and something like that. And it sounded perfect, even though you wouldn't like the, the average uh, uh, creator wouldn't have thought to like, oh, well, there's going to be like a slight tiny bit of reverb here. And uh, there's it, like I, I was watching it with headphones and without headphones at different occasions. And I noticed different things when I had headphones on because you really do have. Uh, intricate detail when you're doing the um, the uh, sound design. Thanks. I mean the and and that's like that's crucial in uh and a lot of it is just setting up the tracks. Uh, it's mm-hmm. it's just thinking. You know, it's thinking. So like for instance, there there's um in the workflow of my editor, I'm gonna have you know three different dialogue tracks for each room type. So wow. so I have dialogue tracks for. Outdoors, I have dialogue tracks for in a small room, dialogue tracks for in a big room, dialogue tracks for distance, dialogue mm-hmm. tracks for uh, inside of a phone booth or a car, uh, dialogue tracks for, uh, you know, a phone, you know, dialogue tracks for everything. It, it, and, mm-hmm. it, you know, it's a different reverb, it's a different EQ, it's a different everything. 
Um, and so like, like with the outdoor thing, like it, 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 you sort you for the outdoor parts, you'll notice that even when they're outdoors, you still hear a little bit of reverb. And so, yeah. uh, like, and that was, I think that was one of the first things where I tried that or no, I might've tried it in, in the Yugi coin or one of those, but, mm. uh, but basically like that, that sound is so crucial for me. And just that reverb, even when outdoors, it, it just creates this feeling of, of like, real existence within the place it doesn't seem too dry and so yeah, it, yeah no that's exactly the thing because it's um like you don't think anyone's going to notice it but if it's not there everyone notices that they're like this sounds flat exactly I can't tell why what's, yep. what's going on with this you're correct yes oh yeah yeah do you have an, any um i know you put out a, a couple of um episodes regarding voice acting uh what kind of mics are you using that you uh, might have recommended well I, I could i could probably tell you the recording setup for every single character because <laughs> oh, you just have it so meticulously like you just mm-hmm. do like it might sound like oh wow but it, it's just you do it so meticulously and you always worry about it to the point where like it just becomes second nature that you know what everyone's recording on also like some of the actors like i'll just like buy recording setups and just send it to them if they don't have like something that's up to the standard for the feature and i'll be like mm-hmm. hey that's your payment so they'll get like you know a few hundred dollars in gear <laughs> and then we go from there um yeah so like oh my god so like well, a lot of the characters, so the, the, the fat guy and then the dad and then, and then, you know, the character I voiced and uh-huh. then a couple other, all that was recorded on Neumann U87 through a, a Neve Portico 5017 preamp. And mm-hmm. then, uh, other people recorded on NLM, uh, sorry, Neumann TLM 102, uh, into like Scarlet interface. And then, you know, sometimes for, for the smaller roles, like AT 2020 into, you know, audience, you know, the ID interfaces and oh my god the you know but but neumann is number one um but beyond all that i was just making sure that everybody had the right room there were there were a lot of actors who would come in for like one or two line bit parts um Mm. and i won't name names but like they would come in they're like oh yeah you know they have the little professional looking page i'm like okay yeah so so they should know what they're doing they spent all this time on the thing that that means that they've spent so much time on on their craft that now it's spilled over into looking professional right because that's how i did it Mm -hmm. i made i made sure that my stuff was professional before i tried looking professional um so you would go to a guy and i'll be you trust him oh yeah i don't need an audio test so you get the clip room is way too echoey too far from the microphone all this stuff and so you end up paying like eight bucks and then you don't even use the recording you know so yeah that happened yeah, a couple yeah. times yeah that's probably that's probably where i am i'm probably one of those uh, uh <laughs> voice actors i um i i thought it was really funny um when i called you the other day because i had um been checking out your videos regarding voice acting when i was sort of setting up my uh situation and trying to get like the the um adjust my room and and the location where i'm recording and like um the sort of effects i'm doing on my audio to clean it up and uh and then you in the thumbnail of the video even it shows a blue yeti microphone which is the one i typically record on there's a big x through it i was like oh no i can't i can't do an interview with this guy when i'm recording on the microphone he specifically said not to use i mean i don't care it's i mean <laughs> if, you, if you're doing a podcast it, it, it doesn't matter it's just like like don't use a blue yeti if you're working for like a cartoon or you want to sound like a really crisp narrator you know don't mm-hmm. use it for that but like if you're just if you're just doing some podcasts like it, it's not like no one's gonna care. Like you know, yeah. it, it's that's just how it is. I think it was a uh, who's the uh, AOC running for president. I think she had a she took a picture of herself recording into a blue yeti or something like that. Was that? Yeah. Did you see that? Yeah, 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 yeah. That was it. Um, but I don't know. It doesn't matter. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I was I was getting a bit self conscious about it and everything. Uh, it was a good thing it's not an issue. I'm actually recording on uh, Chris's setup right now. He's been. Uh, really nice and helps set up all this stuff and he knows way more about audio engineering than me so this is gonna probably gonna be the first episode of our podcast that actually sounds halfway decent oh yeah no i could talk about sound design all day that's that's sort of like my new um or not my my new passion but it's like it's like the thing i feel is spoken about the least on the internet so i, I like mm-hmm. talking about the stuff that doesn't get talked about a lot yeah i was having a hard time finding stuff um is all of your uh, knowledge based off of experience, or did you go through the same thing of like sitting down and talking, skyping with people? You you start off where it's just experience and trying to do it, and then over time, yeah, I mean, yeah, you you talk to guys, hey, but you know, you have this sound effect, you have that sound effect. What should I do? How should I place the mic on footsteps? How mic placement is huge for recording sound effects. 
you know, uh, so getting into mic placement, getting into, oh, how do I EQ these footsteps? You take out the mids to make them sound female. You put more mids in to make them sound male. You, uh, you know, you, you got to put this reverb on. You attenuate frequencies above 5,000 hertz. You, you know, you got to uh, you take out the bottom 100 hertz. Sometimes you put a bump at 2,000 hertz to, you know, get more clarity. Sometimes you, mm. you know, if you if you have a Neumann microphone and it has a lot of clarity and then you have an AT2020 right next to it and it doesn't sound matched, then you got to up the high end, like above 10K, like all these different things. Yeah. All the, like there are so many rules and so many little things you just develop and create. And, and me saying that, that was like two percent of it, like you <laughs> yeah. know. And so it's um, I mean, look that that's why, I mean, that's why my videos get cited by universities, I guess. <laughs> like like the like mm -hmm. era, uh, this kid from like Arizona State was like, oh hey, they're playing your videos in my class, and then the, another kid from like Eastern Michigan was like, oh they're playing your videos in my class, and so um uh you know Dang. those universities owe me a check, but that's another story. <laughs> the, <laughs> no, but um I didn't really need their validation to to feel like I knew what I was doing, but yeah. I can take that and say it to other people to look more important. So that's pretty funny. Yeah. Yeah. No, it definitely works. You definitely sound qualified for doing all those workshops uh, that you're doing. And uh, thank you. I would definitely recommend anyone listening. If you're interested at all in any aspect of the, uh, the film industry, whether it's uh, doing just films or around town, doing anything professional on set or, uh, uh, doing things online to there was um, a guy check out there was a guy yeah. who took a workshop once and and mm -hmm. literally he was trying to figure out he took the workshop to figure out if he wanted to be in the film industry if, if you know if if he wanted to like learn all the stuff and he took yeah. it and i went through just a bunch of stuff and then at the end of it he was like yeah i don't think i want to be in the film industry i was like <laughs> hey man that's cool <laughs> like it's you know but like sometimes people that that might be worth 80 bucks to someone to just realize okay i'm not going to waste my time with this because i don't want to learn x y and z and that's absolutely mm -hmm. fine there's i have no problem with that yeah no that's what i hear on um all these other things that i'm checking out about the the industry is like it's it's okay to 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 jump into it to see if it's something that's going to be for you it's not for everyone and it's um i i definitely do think it's worth it to to check out a workshop like one of the workshops that you're uh doing to see if that works for you because sometimes people realize that this is way more daunting than i thought it was going to be oh yeah <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so oh, good Anyway. Yeah, exactly. The 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 aspect I was uh, interested in regarding um, your uh, future film is the the writing. I'm very much into the the writing, like we were touching on before. All right. And it's there's a there's a process that I feel no one is talking about because even though you could find quite a few um, things in the same realm of of dubbing and abridging and and things like this, um, there's not really like a how to write a script for one of these. They'll do a ton of things on editing the lip flaps and the sound design and stuff like that. But I, so I recently went through this of, of writing, uh, uh, it was like 20 minutes of a, of an abridged episode. And it was, I ran into a ton of problems, but it was all in the writing and I didn't anticipate that. What do you do when you sit down and write one of these um, start to finish? So for this, um, I took five of the Conan movies, the first five Conan movies, put them mm -hmm. all in a timeline. I went through and I clipped out all the little parts where it was just talking or, mm -hmm. or mostly just talking anyway. So I'm going through, I'm clipping out all those parts that I think, oh, okay, I'd like that in the movie. I'd like that in the movie. I'd like that in the movie. So I take all that. I delete the rest of the movies. So now I have about, you know, 70 minutes of just clips, clips mm -hmm. with no audio, no nothing. And so now the next step is, okay, what, you know, what do I make this clip about? What do I make this clip about? What do I make this clip about? And I sort, I start slowly sorting the clips and organizing the clips in a way where it's going to tell a concise story. It's going to go on from one clip to the next. And, um, and so from there, you write out the bullet points of, okay, what's the purpose of this clip? What's the purpose of this scene, this scene, this scene, this scene? And then, um, yeah, so essentially you turn the clips into scenes. And now once mm -hmm. you have that, uh, now that you have the organization of the story and, you know, what what setups and payoffs and, and all that, you have all that meditated, you know you know where the story is going to end before you start really writing the dialogue. And then what you do is you go in and and you you fill out, you know, you fill out the time. You fill it up with jokes, you fill it up with, um, you know, light exposition dialogue, you fill it up with character development or whatever, you fill it up with everything. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so that's sort of the process. And so pe uh, there were people talking to me who were surprised that, uh, like it, it just seemed like one fluid film to them, but I was like, no, that was like, 
you know, that was the fourth movie going into the first movie, going to the third movie, going to the second movie. Like every clip was something different. No, I was totally, I'm totally surprised finding this out right now because it totally does look like it's, it's one entire film. And it seems like if you had no idea that, uh, like you'd never heard of Detective Conan, you never watched that, you would think watching this like, oh, this is the show. The, the story works perfectly with the, with what you see on screen and the, what, um, a di- another difficulty that I ran into is the voice of the voice actor isn't matching the facial expression of the character. And obviously when they originally do the recording in Japan, they do animation second. But then when you're doing the ADR in, in English, there's no, this in, entirely in Japan, new problem. In Japan, they do the animation first. Oh, really? I didn't yeah. know that. Because uh, I know they do that for the Miyazaki films. Uh, yeah. And I know that... Or I was talking to people of Funimation. They said that the the Japanese actors also have to dub as well. Um, so essentially, there there is never a true version of any of these shows. It's <laughs> it's kind of weird. Yeah, that's weird. They, yeah, they're definitely prioritizing the art first. I know with Hayao Miyazaki, he's just like kind of entirely different than all, all the other oh, yeah. uh, production he, studios. He is do it. undeniably the goat. He is he's the greatest of all time. <laughs> no question. Yeah. It's uh mm-hmm. and I just love how he lets everybody know it as well. Mm-hmm. I, I love how he'll say the rest of anime is horrible. I I, I love yeah. that. Like it's uh, that that's cool yeah, to me. It's it's it sounds like it sounds like overconfidence them being cocky, but then you look at like the skill level they have it's like, oh you know what this is an exact level of confidence that they should be at he's yeah i i've seen uh, uh or or read things of hayao miyazaki just dissing anime fans all together uh, like as a whole calling them disgusting and stuff like that like wow i feel sort of uh i embarrassed to even watch your films now i feel like i'm not good enough right i mean i don't know i know he's not talking about me so <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm secure but the, i don't know i'm sure i'm sure there's somebody who just hates uh the fans of something that i like or whatever but uh, i don't know mm-hmm. I, I haven't looked into it yeah yeah no i was uh the just the whole concept about doing the adr stuff um right uh get it directing the voice actors uh it's a different process d- like directing live or directing prior to an animation and oh, did you run into any sort of issues uh directing doing this adr uh, you, you run into issues directing with anything, really. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just what it is. Uh, h- how would I put it? Well, usually the process is some lines require more ADR pacing than others. Um, mm-hmm. So, so for instance, the lines where you can just make it as long as possible and you're going to be redoing the lip flaps anyway and it doesn't matter, those are the yeah. easiest ones to direct. Um, mm-hmm. And sometimes you run into barriers where, uh, or just cultural barriers where there's certain manners of talking uh, that you know, that pass forth jokes and like just cultural notions and concepts that an actor from the UK or an actor from, you know, or another part of the country or Canada or whatever might not understand. So you have to sort of go through and sometimes like phonetically break down how it's supposed to be said. Sometimes you have to like, uh, like, like I, I really, I literally, I've gotten into things with actors where I'm like, okay, place your lips here when you say this word, mm-hmm. you know, stuff like that. So that that's I'd say that's like the easiest those are the easiest ones though. The next level of difficulty is the ones where it's all just action and you have to make sure everything is synced up and there's no freezing, everything's moving and you can't mess around with it. That's the next level of difficulty. You know, it takes a couple more takes. Sometimes you have to show the footage, but you usually get it. Now, this is the hardest. The hardest one of all is where the edit is all in place, the final edit's all in place, and I recorded a scratch track for the actor to come in, and Mm -hmm. the actor perfectly syncing that up, because it has to be perfect, because it's all there, it's all in stone now. Uh, Those are the hardest, because that has to be completely spot on, or else it's just, you know, everything's messed up. I mostly do read mimicking, because when you're delivering punchlines, it's just, dude, just emphasize this, this, and that, and you're good. That's Mm -hmm. usually what it is. Um, And that'll work... That'll work for not just actors, but like, you know, some actors don't like that. Um, but yeah. like, listen, buddy, this is my vision. But no, no the uh, <laughs> uh, what's it called? Some actors don't like that. Some actors are like, yeah, sure, that, that makes my job easy, you know. But then, uh, you know, there, there's there's Meisner and through lines, and then there's mm-hmm. uh, Linklater. Like, okay, put your chin here when you see, and you know, 
all that different stuff. But, uh, you know, you sort of learn more methods when you talk to a variety of actors because you might learn, you might meet a Linklater trained actor. You might meet a Meisner intensive actor. And so they'll mm-hmm. tell you all the little tricks and, and things and they'll tell you a bunch of stuff that that helps them sort of do the read. And then you take that and memorize it. So you got your free little Meisner class. And now you can now it's not like your real, real Meisner train, but you know, you yeah. have those little tips and tricks, and now you can take that to every other actor. And um the, the important thing with being a director, and and the reason why uh, you know, I feel like the title of director kind of needs to be gatekeeped is <laughs> is like Look, uh, how would I put this? You can't, the, the good directors, the, what separates a director from a good director or a coach from a good coach or whatever is mm-hmm. the ability to teach beyond the role or beyond the game. I see. It's the ability, like, so, you know, I need, when I step up to be a director, I don't need to just, like, understand, okay, I want this read. I need to know a whole slew of other things. I need to make sure that if this actor is having trouble, that I can provide a learning experience for this actor. It's mm-hmm. not just not just oh, do my line. Oh, hey, you, you tried your best. You know, it, it's not that. <laughs> it, it's it's literally okay. Well, we're gonna get into this. We're gonna get into that. And you know, some actors are uncomfortable with that, and um, you know, just stop acting. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> like like it's just like you got to be able to take criticism. Um, yeah. And you know, sometimes I'll talk. One time, uh, I t- I talked to talk to someone as young as like 15 and and mm-hmm. I was trying to work with them I was trying to work out like delivery with them for a radio show bit and cuz yeah. they it was just somebody who randomly called in they're like yeah I want to help so I'm like okay dude so I'm talking to them and uh I'm like no say it like this like that no you got to emphasize everything you got to really push out with every word and I'm getting into all these sentences and they're like wow they're, they're like this is the first time anyone's like ever told me how to do it this is this is crazy I'm like yeah I know mm-hmm. you know so <laughs> it, it's yeah, I feel like you can't really enjoy the directing process until you actually like when when I, when when people do it here and there, they're not gonna get it, they're not gonna enjoy it. But then when you really like sit down and like do a project, and you can see how you're not just like bullying people around, like you're helping actors reach not only your vision that you have, but a, a, a potential that they wouldn't have had if you weren't directing them. In a way, yes. Correct. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So where can, um, when can people watch this, uh, future film, uh, uh, taste clothes, October, 2019. Um, the, the, I'm trying to get it on YouTube, but like with, mm-hmm. you know, copyright stuff, it, it, yeah. it gets wonky. Uh, I'm trying to get it on the channel SBN three. That's where I'm trying to put mm-hmm. it. Uh, but we'll see, but, uh, I'll, if, if I can't get it, whatever, uh, I'll have it on Patreon just for, for the people there. Uh, just, mm-hmm. you know, for the meantime, so the people who backed, at least they can see it so they don't have to wait. Uh, but I'm trying to get this on YouTube. I'm trying to get this on YouTube for everybody to watch. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to I'm gonna pull out all the stops. I'm going to try whatever I can. And also, this all is right. getting distributed. Yeah, it's also getting distributed on VHS. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. You were telling me about that. Like, that was a lot of the funding went into that, right? Yeah. Uh, so, essentially, the what people got for funding is we'd be like, okay, we ma- mail a VHS tape straight to your door of, of the picture, mm-hmm. and it has a full label and a case and everything. And we did that for another thing, uh, Operation Backpackers. Yeah. We did it for that. And, um, you know, we had, like, 50 tapes sent out all over the world. And uh, people were like, oh, this is cool. And there was bonus features on the tape, too, stuff that you can't get unless you, you know, got the physical tape in your VCR, um, if you still own one. But uh, yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, no that that is the, that's the coolest I, idea I've only ever seen. Uh, uh, there, there's that one guy like Steelberg or something like that. He he makes a he makes a living off of converting new films into VHS tapes, and then he'll redesign like a '90s style uh, VHS cover. I, I think that's the coolest idea. I I'm very much a fan. Anyone who knows me knows I'm very much a fan of uh, like collecting old VHS tapes and like completing collections of stuff like that. There is there is a difference. You're definitely uh, obviously very much into like the early 2000s era which is what uh you're you've had two albums come out um uh correct or is there do you, are there more than two, that i had two mixtapes they're not tech uh, technically they're not albums um okay because there's no real label you know what i mean uh i see yeah just mixtapes um but yeah i had two uh one was called 2000 on everything the other was called it's mm-hmm. not the 90s and basically mm-hmm. it was just sort of uh a romanticizing of that era of music and culture yeah, so you put that um, that recent album, uh, it's not the '90s, out uh, at the beginning of the year, right? Uh, yeah, like January. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Where can people listen to that? 
Uh, they can listen to it on Spotify, uh, SoundCloud, YouTube. Um, I think like Apple Music, even Tidal, uh, maybe Pandora too. They can uh, everywhere. I should have just said everywhere. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not just anyone listening to this. It's not just one more guy on YouTube making rap and hip hop like Jake Paul or whatever. It's like it's actually good. It's real writing. It's real production. It, Thank it you. sounds 100 percent legit. I absolutely loved it. I wish I I, I could have uh, sent it to Chris to listen through prior because he does a lot of sound mixing and producing. He would have had a much better, deeper opinion than I could uh, possibly have. But uh, yeah, we were checking it out on uh, Genius going into some of the lyrics. And uh, one of the songs uh, I was checking out in particular, uh, Money Like Play. Musical bear hug, Scandinavian style, from four unbearably hot teenage stars singing I'm Gonna Make You Love Me, Swedish pop sensations, play. You see the cat, you see the cat. Made in a day, made in a day. Making you love me. Hey. I made that money like play. Money like play. Stock on the bass, we keep it safe. Offshore the bank, dividends pay. Making you love me. Hey. I made that money like play. Money like Rosie, play. get it paid. And I'm pulling up the rave. I need to put that ice on me. Going Hamlet like I'm bae. Get it all day. You see the cat, you see the cat. Made in a day, made in a day. Making you love me. Hey. I made that money like money like. Money like yeah, play. so the first verse on this song, Money Like Play. Uh, well, first of all, the title is just initially just sounds a little bit confusing. You you explained to me before what the the title and the song was about. Well, okay, so Money Like Play was um, basically in the early 2000s to capitalize on the girl groups and boy bands like, you know, mm -hmm. Destiny's Child, like Backstreet Boys, so on and so forth. Uh, there were tons of like little groups that just popped up. And uh, there was a group from Stockholm, Sweden uh, called Play. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was it was four girls, and they were all like twelve or thirteen, and it was just really like it was just totally created by a machine. It was it was so you know, and a lot of people mm -hmm. who are like really really into music hate that, but like the the whole the whole thing with the whole theme with the, uh, the mixtapes I'm doing is that we're romanticizing and taking this back because now you know the label barely develops the artist at all anymore, mm -hmm. so it's sort of it's sort of like this this renaissance for that where like okay let's. You know, and it, let's let's just create a product. Let's see, you know, let's put on a performance. Let's put on a show. Because at the end of the day, like I, I'm really into the entertainment aspect of music. I'm into showmanship. I'm into show business. I'm into all of that. And so, um, you know, because uh, there's an art to show business. You know, even yeah. uh, you know, even though the music itself is not very divergent. Uh, you know, there aren't very deep themes in any of the music. I, I get that, but it's just. It's just the journey is what I follow. Like the production and all the work that goes into it is what I follow, not the music itself. Um, yeah, you know. Yeah, exactly. And the, the, you mentioned something about um, how how the the label makes the uh, the artist, and there's um, re referencing that you had a line uh, later about in the middle. And I'm gonna totally mess up the rhythm on reading this, but Macy's Day smoking gun, but it don't load. Loose lips gonna sink ships. But I lip sync when I'm on the float, and I looked into the uh, what you had there, um, going into that lyric about the whole thing about lip syncing specifically during the Macy's Day Parade. Uh, was that was there anything deeper in that line, or was it just how it appears on the face of it? Well, I mean, it, yeah, it's just it's just little cute little word plays, but then but yeah, and like every artist would lip sync on the Macy's Day Parade, and the Macy's Day mm -hmm. Parade is just sort of like it's like that thing where it's you know you're a you know, you're a big name artist. You're going to be big if you're able to like get to that show. But, uh, mm. you know, they would always lip sync because it was so cold and so early in the morning. And so, mm. you know, it's uh, even uh, even Christina Aguilera, when she did it in 1999 for the Eminem's float, uh, she had to yeah. lip sync and she hated lip syncing. Like she she mm. never did that at her live shows or any of that. So, um, but yeah, I guess that's sort of uh, not, uh, not, nothing too much deeper there, but uh, that's a little bit of the history. Yeah, the, the, the whole rhythm and just like the word choice in in these songs that uh, the the one in particular that i really did like the word choice on let me go back it was um total dial freestyle should have bought a sign game husband caught the nine he caught a body i caught a mine calling minutes i got all the time call me caught me catching souls potting up my decibels commas left the decimals banking is a festival oh, okay. the word choice on it on everything like you uh Honestly, like you could have none of the music backing this up and just do it spoken word. And like, I think very few of the songs would suffer. But with that said, the music on top of it is great. Are you recording that music or do you have people coming in recording with you? 
Uh, Turera Freestyle, uh, that was produced by Rodouch. Or Rodouchi. I, I still don't know that, how to pronounce That guy never told me how to pronounce his name. The, the, <laughs> the, uh, uh, yeah, and then uh, other tracks were produced by uh, uh, Imger Jr. Or IMG Jr. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's so usually the ones that do better are produced by him, and then uh, the intro track was produced by Hubis Tankonia, and I was doing music with him since like 2013. Um, oh, wow! And then let's see here, but then everything where a producer isn't listed, uh, that that was a beat I created. Oh, geez, yeah, yeah. so so I assume you're self taught in that as well, right? Yeah, definitely self taught. Um, ne- yeah, never took a class, I, I didn't even know where to start with finding a class on. How do you sample chop 2000s pop music into trap beats? <laughs> there is no class in that. You know what I mean? Doing the, the sampling, obviously, there presents um, uh, some sort of freedoms and, and, and conveniences. And then uh, on top of it, it creates some inconveniences and limitations. But did you run into any limitations when you're creating this album? Because it sounds like you just like it's it sounds like there's no samples. It, it's just uh, you make everything work so good. Uh, putting it all together and making it sound like it's one cohesive original track. That, that's that's hard for me to grasp just because like I sampled it. it it's yeah. right, no, I, I try to you know it, I guess it's t- it's throwing back to um, like how those like 80s and early 90s hip hop beats were where like you would play the original song and you're mm-hmm. just like you're like oh my god they just stole this you know like <laughs> like it, it's um. That's pretty much how it was. But when I was starting pr- to produce stuff for 2000 on everything, I was I was like learning just like why hip hop is the way it is, and, mm-hmm. and you know why the samples were the way they were, and like the whole reason they did it is because like it was guys who were trying to rap, and they just you know it's just people who wanted stuff to rap over. That's it. And so yeah. like they would take it, they would take a you know a James Brown song, and they they take the intro and they loop that, and they put drums over it, and that was a lot of it was very traditional sampling. Like the sample, the sample choice wasn't so traditional, but like the style of sampling was very very traditional with mm-hmm. with all of this project, very 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 traditional. Um, and, and at the point, there were points where I was sampling samples. Yeah, you know, because oh wow, so, dang, yeah, no, so like the the the. I think it was um, Hollywood Video. That was sampling a JoJo song that was sampling another song from the 70s. Yeah, and uh, so now you're referencing a song that was a cover or a sample of another thing. Yeah. So that's getting real deep in yeah, there. Yeah, that's now. another thing is that so many of those songs that were created by those like machine-type like type groups, like they were all just like redos of 60s and 70s soul songs. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Christina Aguilera's uh, I Turn to You, that was a remake of an all-for-one song, I think. Uh, which was on the Space Jam soundtrack. The original song was on the Space Jam soundtrack, and then they used it for Christina Aguilera's debut album. Um, And then, oh my, so many, so many play songs, so many JoJo songs, like all, so many just just rewrites and redos and covers. And uh, even, uh, yeah, Play had a bunch of those, and oh my God, but um, that's what, like uh, uh, Play had a song called Cinderella. Um, Mm. And uh, Cinderella was originally made by a group called I-5 in 2000. Then in 2002, Play got it. They did a version. And then the Cheetah Girls in 2003 did their version of the song. And so there's like three or four different versions of the exact same song that was Mm -hmm. released by Disney, by RCA, by Interscope, by like everybody. And so it's just just fascinating how (laughs) songs are just thrown around. And it's it's really, but again, I'm not, I'm not here for the music. I'm here for the journey. sounds like you did a ton of research on, on doing this and and listening to the album. Every time I'm going through, I'm picking up on more, more references that you're dropping or or, uh, lines that had double or like triple meanings to them. How much, how much time did you put into doing the research? Uh, It's, it's been like three years of research at this point, maybe for four years of research. Like it's, it's literally all the research, like I, you know, you read, uh, like I got so many, uh, I got the unauthorized biography of Christina Aguilera because uh, I was trying to, because it was all for the, the Aguilera and religion. Like that was the whole like overlying <laughs> yeah. thing that links all the project uh, that links the two projects together. And uh, so I was trying to learn about that. And then I have, I have every single copy of uh, the Rolling Stone magazine in the year 2000. It's just under my bed. And I, I would read wow. through every single one. Um, I would look up, I would Google certain pop star names and I'd go through like just stuff on eBay and if I saw mm-hmm. an interesting piece of advertising or like a store display or whatever, I'd, I'd message the guy. I'm like, hey, what's the history of this item? H- how'd you get it? How'd you whatever? And some guys would give you tons and tons of information of where it came from, what year, everything. And um, yeah. so, you know, there's no real, 
there's no real Wikipedia to like really learn a lot of this stuff. You have to like go out and find it. And so I guess that's sort of I guess that's sort of what fascinated me about it is that um uh, it wasn't as easy as just like looking at a Wikipedia page. It was like, it was real legitimate. Like it went back to traditional research of like, you have to go find a book. You have to go find a magazine, a, a release, you know, go reach out and talk to people. I talked to like, um, Stan Twitter for a year. I was for a good year. I was talking to just a bunch of people on Stan Twitter, like guys who were like, you know, in their thirties and I'm asking them mm -hmm. like, Oh, how were the AOL chat room days? When when Christina Aguilera did this, when Britney Spears did this, what was the reaction? How did everybody feel? How did this <laughs> like? And they'd give you all the history. So I collected all this history, and um, I just I put it in little bits and pieces, and and there you go. Um, it, it wow. was it, yeah, you're definitely going above and beyond and uh, doing all this stuff. I know a lot of people would just like sit down and uh, write a song and put it out as quick as possible and just be whatever that short tier short uh, term ear candy that they wanted to be. But you you're just pouring a ton of work into this you're clearly very passionate about uh the music your music and the music industry as a whole it sounds like uh, honestly it's a lot more passion that i probably should be putting into it because because <laughs> because at the end of the day uh i i mean look I, I need to make sure that it's also ear candy but like people can look into it for another thing like you have to hit on you have to hit on multiple levels yeah really um you know uh so i mean like i got to make sure you know and then so on top of all the research and all that you also need to make sure it sounds good as a rap song. You know, yeah. it, it can't sound, it can't sound lame. It can't, you know, so you try to have all like the fast lines and, and flow and you try to have all the word flips and you try to have all like the, you know, pesa pesa me, vertesa testimony, you know, like you have to, you know, you throw that stuff in every now and then and you got to like, uh, it's, it's just so many, and then you got to make sure you got a melody and then, you know, oh, do I use auto tune for this? And then, you know, it, it, it yeah, no, it, it, it's a ton of stuff. And like, I don't know when I'm doing it. It doesn't really seem like I'm like thinking about that much, but like when it's done and I look back and I see other people look at it, I'm like, Oh my God, I did way too much for this. I'm sure you have a ton of, uh, influence from certain, uh, hip hop or rap artists, right? Oh my God. Well, yeah, I'm probably not. I mean, look, I'm better than the average guy who just says they can rap. Um, for but, sure, but yeah. like, like what's it called? The, no, I mean, I, I was watching guy. uh, I was watching a lot of battle rap. That that's sort of yeah. like the 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 you know the the intricate subtle slant rhyme and all that. That's definitely how um that was what made me like step up the mentality of okay, let's think about the flow, let's think about the the wordplay, let's think about uh you know the multi rhyme, the triple mul syllable rhyme, the quadruple syllable rhyme, uh mm -hmm. you know and um but yeah so like I I would uh, a lot of daylight I watched a lot of daylight I watched a lot of um you know it, it, not songs like in battles. Uh, you watch Daylight, you watched Arsenal, I watched, uh, you know, and, and these artists aren't as, uh, you know, you watch Loaded Lux, you watch, you know, and these these guys, they're not really big, like, in the studio album sense, but, like, in, in, mm -hmm. in battle rap and, and, you know, live shows and stuff like that, they're well known, uh, you know, and so it's just, mm -hmm. but then it, it's not just that, like, so that's that aspect, but then you get, you know, the storytelling from another artist, and then you get, like, the sort of aesthetic sound from another artist, and then or, you know, not, not completely ripping everybody off, but, you know, it's just sort of, I wanted to be in this lane. When I explain, uh, like, the sort of the sound of the album, or at least it's not the 90s, I, I explain it as a, a trippy red. That's sort of what yeah. I say sometimes, because it's like a lot of triplets, a lot of, you know, a lot of, a lot of certain flows. Sometimes it goes into the other, you know, sometimes it goes from triplets to just regular flow, and then lots and lots of melody singing and, and stuff like that. And so... um. Uh, you know, th th that's sort of the, the, the easiest modern comp that I give people of an artist who's popular enough where people know who he is. Yeah. Yeah. You have a, you have another song that you took an entirely different approach and it follows more of like a, I would consider it spoken word. I don't know if that's how you're defining it with the, um, Aguilar and preaching the, the interlude. Yeah. Uh, the seventh yep. track. Yep. Yeah. That, yeah. That I was very totally battle rap. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. No, listen. I'll put it in layman's. We tell her what the payment. The Mel's Club showed her all the ways to make payment. Ron Fair got it in the ways of a famous. Okay, she sang. She sang. Continent. It's the Aguilar religion. See, I talk about a, a lot of the little things uh, that I start. I start on the the sober radio thing I do. Uh, that's where a lot yeah. of the sort of uh, the lore of the channel is started and carried out. Uh, and mm -hmm. then sometimes it'll seep into projects like 2000 on everything and it's not the 90s. But if you just listen to 2000 on everything from start to finish, like that's mm -hmm. that's like all you need to like understand the basis of it. And then it's not yeah. the 90s really just builds upon that. 
Uh, but uh, a lot, yeah, no, a lot of people liked the Aguilar and preaching. That was a lot of people's favorite track on the whole thing. You know, all, all that stuff. Like, like people and people just like the energy. They like the screaming. They they like all that. Yeah, yeah, no, I totally loved it. The 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 backup track behind it, and then you do a little bit of throwing a little bit of voice acting. It sounds like uh, at the beginning doing that. Um, the voice of ah oh, dang, I forget the name of the puppet character that you do now. Um, oh, Mick, but, Mickey uh, Gooberson. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I so. I had avoided watching those videos. I've been subscribed to you for like a year at least now. And I was like, like I was doing a puppet thing. That's going to be weird. And then like one day, uh, like a couple months ago, like, you know what? I'm going to watch it. And I was like, wow, how is this someone doing a smart puppet video that doesn't even make any sense? And uh, you definitely had a lot of the uh, early 2000s influence in there as well. Oh uh, yeah, no. The uh, I sort of uh, I'd say the one that I did the best with with it was uh, the Christine Aguilera trading cards one. Yeah, that's right. Um, the uh, cause that was that was like the most like by itself thing. But then I had Puppet Life, which was just a little series of short films. But like Puppet Life was important because I didn't have actors. Like I didn't have anybody to work because I was uploading those since 2013. I didn't have mm -hmm. actors. I didn't you know like I I didn't have anything to to work with. All I had was a T2i DSLR. You know, a couple FD lenses and you know some sheep EF lenses, and mm. and and a puppet and a Hungry Man box and a bottle of mustard and, <laughs> and stuffed animals and that's all I had. So I'm like, I'm gonna make this. You know, yeah, no, that's that, you know that is exactly what I thought you were gonna say because I'm like, did he run out of stuff? Did he not have actors? It, it's it's but you definitely have the mentality of not letting any sort of obstacle get in your way when you don't have actors. You just do it yourself when you don't know how to do the thing. You sit down and you talk to someone, and that's that's the kind of advice I give people. Uh, just just to close out, what kind of advice would you give people getting into film and get, getting into music? You you yeah. can't let you can't let any obstacle. You gotta upload like if you want to build a fan base. If like if it's really what you want to do and you want to build a fan base and and show that you're marketable and show that your music makes sense and all that, you gotta you gotta upload constantly. Like so right now what I'm doing until the taste closed feature drops on YouTube, until Taste Closed mm -hmm. Heaven and Hard Find comes out on SoundCloud right now, I'm uploading a new song every day. Mm -hmm. I'm just making yeah. a new song every day. It's, it's just like little one off, little one minute, ninety second song stuff like that. So like what I'm gonna upload after I get off here is. I'm going, it's, uh, the, are you familiar with, uh, Sway's, uh, Five Fingers of Death freestyle? Like he does it on yes, his radio yes, show? Yes, for sure. So yeah. what I'm, so <laughs> my friend got up a little thing. He took all the Nintendo 64 Pokemon BGMs and, uh, <laughs> it's the, uh, five Pokemon BGMs death of death freestyle. And, mm -hmm. uh, so that's going to go up right after I do this. I have the MP3 ready. Um, yeah, well that, you know. that's, that's fantastic. So we can, um, People can already listen to the album, and then they can check out the the SoundCloud every single uh, day. You're uploading something, and you're hoping that the uh, the taste close doesn't take long, so you don't have to keep on uploading stuff. Yeah, every day. yeah, that's the goal. <laughs> that's the goal. Yeah, I think everyone should just watch more Soul Brothers vids, right? There you go. That's the catchphrase. Well, hey, uh, thank you for taking the time. Thank you for the interview. Uh, thank you for the promotion. Uh, yeah, and thank you for taking the time to just uh, look into everything and uh, see what's what. Yeah, no, thank you for, for coming on. I really appreciate it. If there's any other social media stuff that you wanted to point out, then uh, then uh, go for that. I appreciate being here. Uh, the Instagram is a uh, the SBN3. That's mm -hmm. it. That's I'll, I'll plug that one. All right. All right. Sounds good. Thank you for having us on. We'll uh, play into the next part of the, the podcast when we'll be doing our normal sort of uh, episode, talking about debates and stuff like that uh, with Evan and Pearson. Uh, thanks, Max. Uh, you have a nice day. All right. Thank you. You too. See my faith is coming in the mail. You got it on your chain, but mine are broke, so I prevailed. Issue with the visual, my issues let me spell. I'll break it down, I'll make it like, I'll make it like. Check this out. What if Cain and Abel had cable? Were they killing the fable or just sit at the oh, table? Hey, we are back. Um, from thanks for there's that interview there at the beginning with Max. What a great guy. We played chunks of his music throughout it. So I was That's told good. told today would be my interview. I uh, <clears throat> yeah we have to uh, we I probably have to reschedule that we gotta cut it yeah you're boring <laughs> <laughs> you should just say like yeah we'll do it and then just skip <laughs> the <path. laughs> so we'll use whatever <laughs> oh yeah we'll start the interview now it'll definitely be in the final cut yeah oh what a great interview <laughs> definitely worth keeping <laughs> oh man I didn't know you had all those crazy stories about. Um, Ponies. Your, your, yeah, about ponies. All your pony knowledge. You got quite a bit of pony knowledge. Yeah, you got it. Got it built up, stored up, all that stuff. 
uh, <laughs> all your travels abroad. Did we do? Did we just do a cold open about how we skipped the cold open? Yeah. Um, okay, I got a cold open. Um, uh, Pearson, why don't you sing a little ditty to, to get me into my cold open? Like, it could be just like a <laughs> like something like that. La la la. This is a cold open. Oh. It's really cool. Pearson, I like your body noises. <laughs> it's a great way to say singing. <laughs> no, they're called body noise. There's a distinct difference. See, Evan just gave us a body noise too. Burping. I thought that was singing. Uh, <laughs> looks Music like to my ears. Yeah, it looks like we got a bunch of differences that uh, uh, in in a couple of language barriers. Which languages? Uh, body noise <laughs> language barrier. <laughs> There'd be no. What what I like is I, I like doing this, and it's like this is getting popular on the internet. Is finding the most like inconvenient way to word. <laughs> Things like it's they have that thing is like ice, uh, or no, it's like water, no, sea juice, no, um, um, ice sweat, stuff like that. And I thought it would be funny if there was a uh, okay, I'm gonna pitch you guys a, a new show, yeah, it's another um, like hospital drama kind <clears throat> of thing. Um, but there's a doctor who speaks in that way, and so I can imagine to see there's like, um, I'm sorry, ma'am. But your husband has oodles of cancer. <laughs> oodles, oodles of the the the. Uh, oh, what, what would be the oodles weird way to say AIDS. cancer? Oodles of AIDS. What would be the weird way to say cancer? That. Because um, he has pain warts. <laughs> Bad juju lumps. Bad juju. Uh, he has, God hates him. That's what it is. <laughs> Anyways, I'm Zach, and here we got Pearson. Yeah. And Evan. Mm-hmm. This is Hear Me Out. And by the <laughs> and then, time... <laughs> it sounds so passive aggressive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Oh, are you still worried about the interview? No. Okay. Okay, good. Because we're not cutting it out. My interview? Yeah, your interview. Yeah, I just think I've already talked enough about myself. I want to hear more from Oh, guys. yeah, yeah. Man, all those amazing stories that you had traveling abroad. That was yeah. crazy. Um, um, yeah, this is Hear Me Out, uh, podcast by the time this episode airs would probably have a vaguely different name, because we learned that it's a very, very common name for podcasts. That's my bad, because I named it. Okay, on Spotify, there's only one Hear Me Out podcast, and it's by these guys. I, um, I know this. The first episode is Maller wants Donkey to ask him out. Interesting. I really, I don't understand. Oh, here's another one. But it's by Evan. What? It's you. Wait, did you post it? No. Okay. Yeah, I have my own podcast. <laughs> by the way, I mean, yeah, I, I have that other podcast that I haven't uploaded a single episode of that I did with Piercy. Yeah. The, the Killing Zach with Time. Killing Zach. I love that that's become the real name of it. Oh, maybe not. Maybe that's going to be a separate <laughs> sister podcast. Is One is just me... Talking about stuff I'm interested in. The other one is I interview people who hate me and want me to yeah. die. That would actually be a good podcast. It's a show about okay. people There's hating people. There's a podcast people. called Okay, So Hear Me Out. Yeah. So there's a lot of similarities. We're probably going to have to do, like, Hear Me, The Hear Me Out. Oh, here's Hear Me Out with an exclamation mark. What if, okay. what if we put Hear Me Out with a question mark? Hear I don't see a, a... Exclamation mark. Probably no, que- exclamation mark they do have. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> hear Me Out! Hear me out. Hear me out now. Are there... Sponsored I feel like, by Arnold Schwarzenegger. Okay, actually, this brings me into my real first question that we definitely had planned prior and I didn't think of at this exact moment. You have different punctuation marks to represent like different uh, states of the sentence. You have a period, if it's just a yeah. declaration. You have a question mark. Yeah. Uh, if it's a question, <laughs> you have yeah. an exclamation mark. If it's an exclamation. Mm-hmm. But other languages have other, uh, um, uh, what are those things called? Punctuations. Yeah. Um, we need more punctuations. We do need more punctuations. Yeah. Yeah. There's more types of sentences out there. We're limiting ourselves because of our language. The language has limitations. The language has been around for like 1500 years, probably longer. I'm not a scientist. Or ling- linguistin. Uh, linguistin? Yeah. Pearson. Linguistinstein. <laughs> I mean, linguistin. <laughs> What's, Pearson, what new punctuation would you pitch and how, what does it look um, like? How about like flirty? Flirty? <laughs> All right. What would the 
the punctuation look like? That's it would what I look would... like uh, exclamation point, but instead of a line at the top, it's a little hard. Oh, but it's it's already pretty curvy though. What if it was just a slightly more attractive looking question mark? The exclamation mark? mark is not curvy at all. Oh, I was thinking question mark. <laughs> Whoopsie daisy. That's the straightest of them all. Um, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. So let's give a sentence with a, a flirty exclamation at the end. Yeah, Pearson. <laughs> say, uh, I'm going to say hear me out with a flirty exclamation. Okay. No, no. Say How would you say that sentence flirty? <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long time since I've flirted. <laughs> hey. Yeah, Evan's 50 years old. Hear me out. <laughs> well, you can't, like, the thing is, is when you're, when you, when you have a question, you can't just, like, make any sentence a question. It has to start with certain words. So maybe, you're right. maybe a flirty sentence would have to start with, hey, girl. No, that's <laughs> it. That's it. Every flirt, it's bad it's grammar. Like, <laughs> it's bad grammar. <laughs> like, yes, this should begin with the, with a, hey, girl. <laughs> Um, I think that's a bit sexist. Can a girl say "Hey, girl" to a well, guy? Well, see, in other languages, hey there's different um, like prepositions and articles that you use when you're talking to a woman as opposed that's to. That's what a I'm man. saying. We need to oh, make I it see, inclusive yeah. for all viewers. Okay, yeah. So, so would a girl? I well, see, there's um, but punctuations don't vary from from feminine and masculine. So girls also say have to hey say girl. "Hey, girl." Yeah, yeah. This is gonna have what to be if the way you it just reduce it to a "Hey." Because I find it a well, little bit informal. Different. That'll be in the informal way of saying it. Yeah. Not Webster's. It won't work in Scrabble. No, exactly. But but everyone knows what you're talking about. It's a colloquial. It's not even one word. It's so when sentences in Scrabble. In sentence bowl. No, yeah. Uh, Evan Evan plays Scrabble with that's like a great idea for ten thousand board game that uh, I'm gonna pitch units. later on in this segment. Oh, that's great. We actually yeah, that's your next question. What are terrible ideas for board games? Um no, uh Evan, do you have do you have an idea for a punctuation? Um well putting me on the spot here. Yeah, well you just listened to Pierce. I know and he so delivered, so yeah, he that's did. this is difficult. Okay, what yeah. about like uh Hold a on, tired Tired, and it's like an exclamation point, but it's a little droopy. Oh, it's just, <laughs> oh. it's a little lazy. Like it's the pencil you can't press all the way down. Yeah, it has to be a light pencil mark, and then it just kind of trails off at the end. <laughs> you, have, I, you have to put z z z at the end of every <laughs> sentence. No, that's like the that in um, Holy Grail where they write ah, uh, it trails off. Like he didn't write ah. Uh. It's more from the back of the throat. Yeah. It's, Oh. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, no. That sounds like it's that kind of thing. What would be the purpose of that? How would that help the like English language progress and be more easy to decipher? Uh well, if you have a character in a story who's tired, you can save <laughs> yourself two words instead of saying he said tiredly. Ah, that's Actually, good. That would just be one word. Or in um, in a in a like a screenplay when you write uh, like stage directions of how to read the line, it's exactly. like it's already obvious how to read the line. He's tired. Yeah, no, you know, actually that makes you just go. That makes a lot of sense, and it adds a lot more emotion to it. Hear me out. <laughs> Hear me out. <laughs> that sounds more depressed. Well, okay. Actually, I think it takes a lot of acting ability to portray tired. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It's <sighs> oh, hear me out. I am tired. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is the. Well, do you have an exclamation? I do. I do have a punctuation. You were just waiting for us to get to you, huh? Ooh, no, I needed time. Need, <laughs> I didn't have anything. Um, I, I. This is mine. This is my idea. I. So sometimes there's a lot of subtext to like a single sentence. Like uh, maybe, maybe like you're saying this, but it has like like you know when you're watching a movie. And you know the person's a bad guy, and they go, it's like, oh, I'll keep a real good eye on him. And then it like zooms in, he's like, oh, that person's gonna kill that person. So now there's a punctuation for that. And this will help us catch murderers like because they'll just be like, oh, I'm not gonna murder you. It's like, well, they use the, use the that sinister undertone exclamation, so I feel like they're gonna murder me. <laughs> the punctuation of criminal intent. Man, ever since we instituted this new punctuation, we just been catching criminals left and right. All these criminals have great grammar. <laughs> wow, he's he's a Nazi in more than one way. <laughs> a grammar Nazi and a neo-Nazi. What are the chances? 
Oh boy. No, oh, well, that was uh, that was uh, that was a good one. Uh, hey, hey, Pearson, you got some uh, good old inventions for us? You know, I do. Today we're talking about cars. There's lots of good cars. Uh, but we don't care about those. <laughs> we want the bad cars today. All right. Uh, the worst car of all time. Uh, no, yeah, uh, this segment, uh, as our loyal viewers will know. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, <laughs> You're is, disloyal. Yeah. We don't trust you. We don't trust you. Uh, this is a segment where I talk about products that were heard out that shouldn't have been. These are... These are very bad, bad products. You're bad. You're <laughs> naughty products. Um, so they're not innoventions. They're out of Ah, yeah. Well, it's a good thing you're on this podcast because that joke wouldn't really work on any other one. That's way. a bad <laughs> idea. Yeah, we, we we have like a huge safety net um, of terrible jokes and and ideas that we can have because we'll be like, oh yeah, that, we we did that because the, the show's about bad ideas. <laughs> Uh, all right. So here's a here's a here's a great little nugget of a car. Uh, it's the 1955 BMW Isetta. Sounds and great. It sounds Italian, but it's German. Mm. Uh, <laughs> Speaking of Nazis, twelve horsepower. Yeah. Single cylinder, three wheeled city car. Wait, single cylinder? You lost single me. Single cylinder. At German. You lost me at car. <laughs> uh, How many yeah. horses does a like horse-drawn carriage have? Like One. six, right? Or I guess if it's six well, horses, then yeah. I think it depends how rich you are. Like, yeah. the Wells I think it has Fargo, to have at least like, two. The Wells Fargo, yeah. I let, think me, two. let me check my card. Because okay. if it has one, then at that point, it's it's not really a horse-drawn carriage. It's like a much. chariot. It's a chariot. Yeah. Well, so, even two would be a chariot. Huh? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Wait, so maybe what, three. What year did you say it came out? Nineteen fifty-five. Okay, so that might explain the one cylinder. I don't know a whole lot about cars, but I know one cylinder cylinder is less than I have. Yeah. Most cars have like six cylinder, eight cylinder. Yeah. And that gives you more horsepower. But this had uh, twelve <laughs> horsepower. Yeah. So if your car ever broke down, you could just hitch up twelve or. Uh, one really strong horse. Yeah. Why Why do we measure in horsepower? It's. It, I feel like it made sense when you they started making cars. Right. I'm like, this car is equivalent to having ten horses strapped to your car. And, uh, yeah. So, especially now when it's like, oh, it's 5,000 horsepower. Yeah. And you're like, Here's a hear me who's counting? could go nowhere. What else should we measure in horses? <laughs> <laughs> like, as a teacher. As a metric. How good of a, am I of a teacher as compared to a number of horses? To a number of horses? So, so like, uh, most mammals have, have, like, a fairly decent um, IQ. I know, like, the smartest monkey has an IQ of 50, so I'm imagining a horse is closer to, like, 20. How many horses would it take like to do your job as a graphic designer? My job as a graphic designer? I think it's going to take uh, horse hands. <laughs> To do that, I do a lot of typing and, and mouse um, you have related a five activities. Five horsepower job. <laughs> but it doesn't even have to be power. It could be like that's I, how like, you can tell how advanced your job is. is how many horses would it take to do your job? Yeah. So like, if if like my job takes like an average IQ of one hundred, and the average horse has an IQ of I don't know, like twenty. I don't know if that's too high. Um, so I have a five horse brain job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's got this, guy's, or, uh, this guy's got 17 horse brains. How far is your work from your home? Oh, it's about 20, 200,000 horse lengths. <laughs> horse lengths. You know, there is actually a thing. So I learned this in Boston. There's this bridge in Boston, and it was measured. They didn't have um, a means of measuring it for whatever reason because it was so long. So they measured it by laying this guy out, and he was like exactly six foot or something like that. And they measured him out, and they'd pick him up by his leg and his arm, and they'd set him down end over end. And it's actually like something you could go on Google. It's like, convert, um, uh, like, what is 20 feet in Heralds, or whatever the heck his name was. <laughs> like, you could check it out on, on Google. And, like, w when I heard this on this tour that I was on, I was like, yeah, there's no way that's true. And I went into it, I was like, oh, my God. I'm 1.1 Heralds tall. <laughs> this is crazy. Heralds. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, you got another one for us? Uh, I want to keep talking about the BMW Ooh. Assetta because I haven't even gotten to the juicy parts. Oh, yeah, uh, me up. We mentioned 12 horsepower, <laughs> single cylinder, three wheels. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, it's like the uh, round ramen or whatever it's It called. was missing so many things, basically. It's yeah. missing five of its cylinders, one of its wheels. Was it an unfinished uh, car? It came without a reverse gear. It didn't <laughs> go in reverse. And it only had one door. Which was situated directly on the front. No, are you serious? So you'd have to open it up from the front. Wait, and show, climb do, you have, in. do you have a picture of it? It looks cool. It does look cool. It looks really cool. <laughs> it, it looks it looks like a Vespa or, or like an old bug or something like that. Yeah, if you're listening right now, you can look up BMW Isetta and it'll. Did I say Vespa? Picture. I meant Fiat. Yeah, a little Fiat. Yeah, Mini Cooper, not a Vespa. That's <laughs> a. That is a scooter. And but that's just, it's just horrible that you can't back back out of a spot. Yeah, so you can't even like back into the spot so you no, can pull out forward. No. You'd have to pull through every time. You can't go in backwards. Yeah, so how would you do the people like literally push it out of the parking spots or something I guess like that? So. Or they, they end up getting horses to pull it out. <laughs> it's, it's, it's only it's twelve a, horsepower. It's a, it's a <laughs> twelve horsepower cl- car. Horses not included. Horses <laughs> not included. <laughs> Horses sold separately. Horses. <laughs> it has a potential for 12 horsepower. <laughs> you know, what if it was called horsepower because they started making fuel out of horses, like ran off a of glue or something like that? Or Oof. Yeah, that's why it's mentioned. It's like horsepower. miles per gallon. Yeah, no, it's horses per, horses per hoof. <laughs> miles per hoof. That that to me is a weird idea. So like a lot of little kids like horses. I don't like horses because they're big scary dogs. But then also like a lot of times when you're in school, you're doing like arts and crafts stuff. And you're making glue things like, oh, and the teacher, Evan, uh, it goes and uh, uh, says like, oh, we're going to do an arts and crafts project. And like we're going to make a collage of like your, your favorite animal. How ironic would it be when kids like my favorite animal is a horse and they assembled the whole thing with dead horse products like do, did they still make glue out of horses or is that like a dated reference that i'm not aware of i honestly i'm not sure i guess i can google it yeah yeah that's it's that's <laughs> i just think it'd be funny to tell those kids like that's great you love horses so much that you just got them all over your hands and you ate the horse as well is glue made of horse still yeah, it says, according to Elmer's, no horse or any other animal currently <clears throat> is harmed in the making of their product. Well, that kind of messes up my joke. Lame. So yep. Let's let's look at another car. Yes, let's um, do it. The 2003 Citroen Puriel. Sounds like hand sanitizer. Purell. Um, is this a car? Yeah, it's pretty gross looking, um, for one. Mm-hmm. It's not the best. So this is weird. They put the uh, the driver's seat all the way in the back facing the wrong way. No. <laughs> no, it's just backwards. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, so you have to drive backwards the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> when you're advertising a car, why start from the back? Yeah, I don't I don't get it. But uh, the the worst part is as you can see it, it, it it's a convertible. But it's not like the the typical like you have to pull like the top goes back and folds down. It was like there were pieces, so you had to take apart the roof of the car, like with an instruction manual, and you would take it apart, and then to put the the top back on, you would have to reassemble the 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 roof and put it on top like a like a Lego. Uh, instruction like Lego instruction manuals of like putting your car back together every time you wanted to take the hood. And the worst part of it is, <laughs> like, hey babe, you want to go for a ride? Yeah, just, just give me, me give me twenty five minutes. <laughs> yeah, give me twenty to twenty five minutes, and we'll be out of here. With the top down, yeah. then it starts raining, and you're like rushing to put it together. It takes longer to put it back on. I'm sorry. Was it designed by the Swedish potentially um, IKEA? <laughs> Good joke, but I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Um, the worst part like, was... an extra nail! <laughs> the worst part Build is... Car workshop. Listen to the worst part. Okay. All right. This car... The pieces, once disassembled, did not fit in the car. No! Wait, <laughs> then where do you go with it? <laughs> so you can't 
Yeah, that's, put the pieces of the food that's stupid. in the car when you want to take off. You have to leave them at whatever destination <laughs> you're at. Hey, hey, man, I'll be back tomorrow. I'll pick up, <laughs> to my, pick up my, hood. my car hood. My roof. My roof. Oh, my so gosh. That's stupid. That is really stupid. Oh. Why? <laughs> so, okay, it. let's... I'm buying one. Let's think about who, who would have designed this and who... Who would have been the target audience? Who, who wants this? The Swedish. Yeah. I'm thinking people who want to do leave behinds when they're like, like uh, uh, they want to get a second date and then they go back home. There's like, oh, you know what? I left my sweater at your place. I left, <laughs> I left the, my car. Roof. I left the roof of my car at your place. I gotta swing by. <laughs> it really sucks that it's raining tonight, but um, I'll be back to pick it up. And I'll also have a ton of Febreze because this is hot polyester. It's gonna smell like garbage. It rains all the time in Sweden too. What were they thinking? Mm. And snows and stuff. That's there a... were there were other parts of the car that they could have made disassembled. <laughs> what would have been better to make it disassemble? <laughs> like what would you need to disassemble? In a that car? would be in con- that would be convenient. Well, okay. Well, my dad he had a he had a VW Rabbit for for a while. Don't know why he was going through like a very early midlife crisis. Maybe that means <laughs> hey, if you go through a midlife crisis when you're like 15, does that mean you're gonna die when you're 30? <laughs> <laughs> is this like a way to gauge how long your life is going to be? Like, yeah, I didn't get a midlife crisis until I was 60. I'm going to live forever. Uh, but my dad had a VW Rabbit, and uh, it's it's like an older, like, cheap, nasty car. Um, and the steering wheel would pull off. There was nothing to hold it on. And my dad decided to show me and my younger brother this while he's going down a big, steep hill that has a bunch of twists and turns. He's like, hey, you guys want to see something? And he just pulls it off. And he's like, don't worry, I can put it back on. And it takes him slightly longer than I'm comfortable with to put it back on. You didn't understand that this was part of his midlife crisis. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was part of, like, that was the end of life crisis quite nearly. But it was, uh, God, like, that's not a good opportunity to show. I did love that body noise you made when, uh, It's not a body noise. There's some ear candy for you. <laughs> oh, ear uh, meatloaf for you. Some ear, yeah, that's probably a little <laughs> bit more accurate. You heard us out. Now you can see us out. Um, Sorry for all Miami. the annoying body noises. Yeah, all the weird body noises. I know I had the sniffies. If you're new to this channel, um, subscribe to it. And then you could be one of those alumni who like, yep, I was subscribed to that guy from the... I think very we should try to use reverse psychology. Get you the heck what? out of here, you, know you garbage who, human. Who needs you? Yeah, who needs you? Please, if you're subscribed to this channel, <laughs> unsubscribe. Uh, 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 hit that subscribe button. Okay. If you're already if you're subscribed. Only if you're already subscribed. If you're not subscribed, <laughs> do not hit the subscribe button. If you're subscribed, hit the subscribe button. <laughs> yeah, we got a bunch more podcasts. Smash that like button. Turn notifications off. Put your phone on Do Not Disturb. Uh, do I don't like that. <laughs> Just take it. Take out a hammer. Smash it. You don't need your phone. You're wasting your life right now. No, 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 no. I, I need this. Go outside. What are you doing? You know how long it's been since I've had like one new subscriber? I can't risk this. What are you oh, doing wasting your life watching YouTube? Not even watching YouTube videos, just listening to a YouTube yeah, video. Yeah, uh, so, so we have a bunch of other episodes up by, 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 the, by the time you're listening to this one. We'll have a bunch more on the you. channel. we got a bunch more coming out. We're planning on releasing more. Don't listen to them. Uh, if, 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 if you like podcasts, we got it on Spotify, hopefully by now, or, or Anchor. They're the same thing. <clears throat> They're associated with each other. Uh, go check that out. we're not on Apple Playlist. Podcast because nobody uses Spotify. Yeah, but so I, for me, yeah, we get there, there's there's sketches and, and dubs and what are you doing? No, that's a body noise. Evan is um, experimenting with body noises. Oh no! Okay. Baby bag, baby bag, baby bag. I dropped the K and got eighty bag. Baby bag, baby bag, baby bag. Came with the foams, I brought rabies bag. It came with the clip, brought the whole reel, yeah. I prayed to my guy, she said no deal, man. Let it descend, it's a no steal, man. Raise anyway, I'ma steal that ten rounds, don't.